Okay, hi. Welcome to our first video in this series on um, light and optics we'll be doing for the next few weeks. This first video is going to look at what we call the Ray model of light and how it's used to describe and explain reflection off different surfaces. Um, but before we get to that, I guess we better define firstly what we mean when we're talking about optics. So we define optics as being the branch of physics that looks at how light behaves when it does various things, like reflecting off surfaces, passing from one material into another, like from air into water, and then how we can take that knowledge of light and apply it to different sorts of technologies. So be able to create things like reading glasses, telescopes, and microscopes. So we'll start off by looking at the properties, and then maybe if we have time later on, we'll look at things like reading glasses, telescopes, that kind of stuff. But to begin with, we need to sort of go back and quickly recap what we know about light already. So you might remember from our waves topic that light is one particular kind of a wave. Light specifically is a transverse wave. And it moves at its own unique speed, which we call the speed of light. And we use very often in physics, so we always give it its own symbol, lowercase c. Now, the speed of light, if you want to be precise, is equal to 299 million. 792,458 meters per second. But for most purposes, it's okay to abbreviate it to 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Now, as we'll see later on, that is the speed of light. In air, if you put it through other materials, it slows down slightly. Anyway, so whenever you have something luminous, like a candle, it's producing its own light. Those light rays will spread outwards from that object, a little bit like how ripples spread outwards in a pond when you drop a stone into it. Only in this case, those light waves would be in three dimensions. They'd be like a whole bunch of little concentric spheres expanding outwards. Um, the picture on the top of the screen there kind of illustrates that. It gives you a rough idea of what I'm talking about. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's not what I see when I look at a candle. I don't see these whole bunch of light waves moving off in all directions. Well, that's because you only see that part of the candle that actually makes it to your eye. The light from the candle moves off in all directions, but we only see that part of the light that goes directly into our eye, which I've represented here by the straight line going from the, the flame on the candle into the viewer's eye. So given that we only see um, that particular part of the light wave that gets to our eye, um, it makes sense to actually sort of chuck this messy diagram with all of its concentric circles that represents the light wave and just draw that particular part of the light wave that goes into our eyes. So that's what we call the Ray model of light. Instead of drawing the entire light wave like I've done here, we just represent the part of the light wave that actually enters our eye and we represent it using a single arrow like that, which we call a ray. And you'll see that this ray has a little arrowhead on the end to indicate the direction. So it shows that it's going from the top of the candle to the viewer's eye and not the other way around. So this idea of representing how light moves by a whole bunch of um, straight lines, basically, or rays that go from one point to another is called the ray model of light. And it simplifies um, things like working out how light moves through lenses and mirrors greatly. So we'll be using this from now on. We won't be thinking about light as a wave, really. We'll be thinking about it as a whole bunch of rays traveling in straight lines instead. So as our first application of the ray model of light, I want to consider reflection. So as you should already know, reflection is basically when light hits a surface like a mirror and bounces off that and then heads in a different direction. Now, reflection always obeys what we call the law of reflection which means that for a light ray reflecting off the surface, the angle of incidence, which is indicated in this diagram here, incidence means going inwards, so the ray going inwards is called the incident ray, the angle of incidence will always be equal to the angle of reflection, which you can see over here. Now these two angles are always measured around this imaginary line called the normal. It's indicated by this dotted line here. So the normal is like a line that comes out of the surface, like a mirror, at 90 degrees to the surface. So here's the surface here, here's the normal line, you can, you can imagine there's a 90 degree angle between there. So the normal angles, sorry not normal angles, the incident and reflected angles are always measured around that normal line. Now you'll notice here that we've used the subscript theta i, the i there represents incident and the r there represents reflected and that's the convention we're going to use a fair bit in this optics topic. It's very important when you label things not to get confused between incident and reflected and to indicate that clearly by putting in those I's and R's to show which angle is which. Okay, so once we know that, we can then go on to talk about the two main types of reflection, which is specular reflection, 
and we'll cat first and then diffuse reflection. So specular reflection is basically when rays reflect off a smooth surface. So something that's really, really, really smooth. So glass, for example, surface of a polished piece of metal, a mirror, or steel water, like a lake on a completely steel day where the surface of the lake is perfectly flat. So with specular reflection, any sort of group of rays that are coming in off an object, so maybe like from my face, when those rays hit the mirror, because it's smooth, they'll all be reflected off in the same direction. And then the person looking at those reflected rays will see a clear image of the thing that actually produced that light in the first place. So the group of rays that come in stay together as they reflect off the surface, and then the person looking at those reflected rays can make an image of the, what the original object looked like. So that's pretty simple. So for example here, we can see specular reflection action where we see the light coming off the sky, hitting this perfectly still lake, or pretty close to perfectly still lake, and reflecting off and going to the camera. Now when those light rays meet the camera, they've all reflected off in the same direction, so that the camera can see a fairly clear image of the sky in the surface of that water. So that's specular reflection there. On the other hand, diffuse reflection occurs when light rays bounce off a surface that's rough or uneven. So it could be like a fabric on a t-shirt, it could be dirt, it could be asphalt, it could be a whole bunch of things. Basically, if it's all sort of rough and broken up, it'll be diffuse reflection. Now, when you've got a whole bunch of light rays coming in and hitting that surface, they will obey the law of reflection at the point where they hit. So, for example, this light ray here, if I was to apply the normal the law of reflection there and draw a normal line, I'd find the angle of incidence here and the angle of reflection here would be the same. And if I was to do the same thing at this point here with this light ray, draw a normal line, work out the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection, that would obey the law as well. But the normal point, because the surface is uneven and because the normal point is always at 90 degrees to the surface, um, it's going to be different at each point, which means that the light rays will be reflected off in a whole bunch of different directions. So when a person views those reflected light rays, the reflected light rays that they view are not going to be from the same original group of light rays coming off an image. So you're not going to see a clear image of what's, what's reflected off the surface. In fact, you may not see anything at all. So you'll see light coming off, but you won't be able to make out what that light actually is. So if I was to look, um, let's say I was to shine a torch in a mirror. If I shine a torch in a mirror, which is specular reflection, I can see, obviously, light coming off that, but I can also see the image of that torch in the light that comes off the, the mirror. Whereas if I was to do that with something like a, a white t-shirt, for example, put it in a dark room, turn the lights off, shine a torch at it, um, I'll be able to see that there's light reflecting off the white t-shirt, but I won't be able to actually see the image of that torch that produced the light in the t-shirt because it's diffuse. It's taken the light that came off the torch and it's scattered it in a whole bunch of different directions, so it doesn't form a clear image anymore. Okay, so from there, let's go on to now look at our next thing, which is imaging and mirrors, which is basically, when we're talking about specular reflection here, it's basically looking at how... Um, in, now I want to return to specular reflection. I want to have a bit of more detailed look at how images are formed in mirrors. So an image is formed in a mirror when light rays reflect off the mirror and they go to a person's eye. When that happens... What we see, we see uh, an image of the object we're looking at in the mirror, and it appears, it appears that the object is behind the surface of the mirror. And what we call that is we call that a virtual image. There's an image of whatever you're looking at being produced in the mirror, but it's virtual in the sense that we can't actually touch the light that forms that image. It appears to be behind the mirror. So, for example, in this diagram here, you've got the dog. Light rays come off the dog. They hit the mirror. As they hit the mirror, they reflect off according to the law of reflection. And then those light rays encounter a viewer's eye. And when the viewer's eye sees those reflected rays, we just assume that light rays come to us in a straight line. So our brain basically tracks those light rays backwards, and it perceives it as coming from a point inside the mirror. So the inside the mirror, we perceive a virtual image of that dock. But it's virtual because we can't reach in and touch it. So sort of it's behind the mirror as such. And that's different to, say, the image that's cast when you shine a projector onto a wall. Um, because you can actually touch the light that forms that image on the projector. You can reach onto the wall that you're casting onto and touch that image. So that, that's what we call a real image. We'll go into more detail on that later on, but there's a distinction between the two. So we get this virtual image behind the mirror. And the other thing about that virtual image is that the mirror will flip the image. 
So it still appears the same in the vertical direction, but it's back to front in the horizontal direction. So for example, if you raise your left hand in the mirror, um, the mirror image you see inside there will raise its right hand. Or if you wear a t-shirt that has writing on the front of it, when you look at that yourself in the mirror, you'll see the text on that t-shirt being reversed. So this diagram here kind of represents how that happens. I've taken the letter T, I've drawn a series of rays coming off that letter T at like the, the main parts of it, the parts that make up its shape. I've reflected them off using the law of reflection and they meet a viewer's eye, a bit like that image of the dog in the previous slide. Now, if we were to trace those rays backwards and form the virtual image that sits behind the mirror, we can see that when I put together the rays for the various parts of that letter T, that I end up with an image that's flipped back to front. But only in the horizontal direction, you'll notice it doesn't occur in the virtual direction. Um, that's actually quite an interesting thing to consider for itself. Why do we get images flipped in the horizontal, but not in the vertical? But it's a bit beyond this short video, so I'm going to post a link to another video on YouTube, um, not my own, that you can have a look at. I'll put that on the Moodle page. It kind of explains how that works. And lastly, we're going to look at curved mirrors and how they reflect light. So what we're looking at previously are what are called plane mirrors, P-L-A-N-E. Another word for flat mirrors, basically. We're going to have a look at curved mirrors now. And curved mirrors come in two kinds. We have what's called a concave mirror, where the curve of the mirror kind of faces towards the light rays. And if you shine parallel rays of light, like these four here, onto a concave mirror, they'll reflect off the concave mirror. When they do that, they'll be following the law of reflection at each point. So here, that light ray is, allow me to move myself for a sec. Here, that light ray, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection will be the same. Here, angle of incidence and angle of reflection will be the same. Same here as well. The only difference is that the normal point's in a different direction at each point because the mirror is curved. So the light rays reflect off according to law of reflection. And that when they do that, they meet at a point here that we call the focus. Meet for a brief instant and then sort of spread off in different directions as they keep going. Now, when we talk about this focus, we can also talk about the focal length, which is the distance between that focus and the center of the mirror as represented here. Now, what we'll get here is another example of these real images as opposed to virtual images. So that point there where the, the light meets, I can put my finger there and touch that light. It's a real image. It's not a virtual image that appears behind the mirror like we had before. Now, we can use these concave mirrors for a number of interesting things. So, for example, we can have um, solar cookers, which are basically concave mirrors where you stick some food you want to cook at the focus point and then point that towards the sun that gathers light rays from the sun, focuses it to a point where it gets very, very, very hot, hot enough to cook food, basically. We can also apply the same principle for something like a satellite dish. So if you look at a satellite dish, it's, it's a concave mirror, basically, but in three dimensions. It's what we call a parabolic reflector is a technical term. And uh, radio waves from outer space, from a satellite, radio waves are basically a form of light. So radio waves from a satellite will come in. They'll reflect off the surface of the satellite dish, a bit like light rays off a curved mirror, and they'll focus to a point which is basically where this receiver is. So all of those radio waves get focused to a point, which makes a really strong radio signal at that point. We then place our detector there, and that detector will pick up that strong radio signal and send it down to your TV so you can watch OzStar or Foxtel or whatever. And then also, okay, there's your solar cooker there. I wondered what happened to that picture. So you can see here that we've got um, a curved surface, another one of those parabolic reflectors made of like little bits of mirrors. They all focus towards the food in the center here, and that food in the center here will get very, very, very hot, be hot enough to cook. And then the last one is what we call a directional microphone. Now, a directional microphone actually doesn't apply to light, it applies to sound waves, but we get the same sort of law of reflection if we're talking about sound waves as, as well. So the sound waves bounce off this parabolic reflector and focus to a point where you place a microphone, and you can use a directional microphone like this to amplify sound. You basically point it towards the thing you want to listen to, and you'll be able to hear that from a massive distance, like from, um, you might be able to listen to two people talking from 100 metres away or more. It's a very, very, very effective way of listening into people talking. 
So convex mirrors do the opposite of concave mirrors. Con convex mirrors is where the backside of the curve faces towards the light rays. So it curves outwards towards the light rays like that. Now, when parallel light rays like the four coming in here are reflected off a convex mirror, they're spread out in a whole bunch of different directions. So they won't form a real image because they'll never meet at the point. But if you were to trace those reflected rays backwards, like these dotted lines here indicate, they'll meet at a virtual focus point behind the surface of the lens. So in other words, they're going to form a virtual image a little bit like we saw inside the plane mirrors a couple of slides back. So concave, sorry, convex mirrors don't have quite as many applications as concave mirrors, but we can see one common application here. A convex mirror, one that bulges outwards, is quite often used at tight intersections if you want to be able to see round corners so you don't end up T-boning another car that's coming in the opposite direction. So that's one common application of convex mirrors. You might also sometimes see them stuck onto the little tiny ones stuck onto the corner of car mirrors so you can see a little bit around the blind spot in the back of your car. Quite useful. So that's it for our look at the Ray model of light and reflection. Um, next time we're going to go on to look at refraction of light, which is when light passes from one material into another, say from air into glass or from air into water, that kind of thing. So please make sure you've made a note of any difficulties you had or anything you want to discuss in class next time. And uh, other than that, I'll see you in class uh, on Friday. Okay, I'm out.